She was the most beautiful Serena in Russian history, and she outshone Catherine the Great. She was better than Catherine the Great in beauty and politics. Compared to Catherine the Great's beauty of power, her beauty alone was enough to win the hearts of all men. Even her nephew spoke her name before he died. And she was Elizabeth Petrovna, the sixth Serena of Russia. Of course, the glory of the future was a distant dream for Elizabeth, who was only 16 years old at the time. Now she was just a naughty girl who liked to skip school, ride horses with her guards on the beach, run around in the mountains, and love new things like snails and insects. But it was her innocence that attracted the guards. Elizabeth's truancy was another headache for the tutor. The tutor resigned from Peter the Great. This was the eighth tutor hired this year. Peter the Great became so angry that he asked the guards to bring Elizabeth back. At dinner, Peter the Great accused Elizabeth of being too wild. He knew that Elizabeth had learned everything, but studying was not only about knowledge, but also about rules. Although Elizabeth is often naughty and skip school, she speaks French, German, and Italian. Elizabeth combines the opposite personalities of her parents. She had her father's Peter the Great's wit and temper, and the restless energy to ride, hunt, and dance. She also had her mother's natural charm and sympathy. Elizabeth had always positively admitted, but never corrected Peter the Great's advice on rules. Peter the Great sighed helplessly and said that perhaps Elizabeth would understand better if she married. Then he stated his purpose. He's invited Duke Karl, the first heir to Sweden, to Russia for a match. He was not decided which princess would marry, but Peter the Great favored Elizabeth. But Elizabeth had always believed in free love. So how could she accept an arranged marriage? She criticized Duke Karl's portrait, making Duke Karl look like a genetic mutant. Peter the Great wanted to hit her, but when he saw his favorite daughter, he took it out on the food. And Elizabeth was so intimidated, she had to go to the ball to hide her shocking appearance. Elizabeth had her maid of honor take off her custom-made gown. She had to make herself look even uglier. So Elizabeth showed up at the ball dressed as a man, but it only emphasized her long legs. Duke Carl was instantly attracted to Elizabeth and asked her to dance with him. This didn't sit well with her older sister, Anna, who had a crush on Carl. Anna was always in the background because of Elizabeth's beauty. When they think of Russian princesses, they think of Elizabeth, not Anna. Elizabeth had no intention of marrying Carl or competing with her sister. She turned down Carl on the grounds that she was dressed as a man and could only dance with women. Carl shows his disappointment. Elizabeth has already had a crush on her guard, Baturin, and winks at him at the ball. When she sees Baturin leaving the ball, she thinks he's jealous and rushes after him to explain her true feelings. Their kiss was seen by a guard who had long been fond of Elizabeth, thinking Baturin's taking of his goddess. First kiss was an affront to his honor. He wanted to fight Baturin, though dueling was strictly forbidden by Peter the Great. Baturin saw that his mind was made up and agreed. That was Elizabeth's charm. One unintentional gesture and countless men would die for her. The duel ended when Baturin didn't want to fight, but the guards did and wounded Baturin. In a few days, Peter the Great will be away on business. He said that when he returned, he would marry Elizabeth and Carl, because Carl chose Elizabeth over the two princesses. Before Elizabeth could plead, Peter the Great said, it was his decision and no one could object. It was either marry Duke Carl, or go to the North Pole and grow vegetables. When Peter the Great left, Anna was not happy. <laughs> Elizabeth didn't want to argue with her sister, but found Duke Carl. She even lied about losing her virginity before marriage and being a morally deficient girl. But Carl didn't seem to believe her. He seemed to go crazy with Elizabeth and said he didn't mind Elizabeth's behavior. He would keep Elizabeth's secret for the rest of her life. Carl's infatuation caused Elizabeth a lot of problems. But what she didn't expect was for Peter the Great to break off the engagement. The Russian queen was caught in the act of fornication by Tsar Peter. The queen was so terrified, she trembled. <laughs> But the calm before the storm made it all the more frightening. Peter the Great kicked her lover out of bed, then helped the queen with her dress. He smoothed the queen's hair and dragged her by the hair from the bedroom to the study. 500 meters away, the cries of pain echoed through the palace, but no one dared to stop the furious R. The lover was so frightened that he pissed all over the bed. After an agonizing ordeal, Ekaterina was freed in the study, but this woman, who had committed a terrible crime, did not care about the pain. She bowed down and begged for her husband's forgiveness. Peter the Great did not kill her, but did something far worse. Peter the Great produced a testament saying that he had intended to make Ekaterina his successor as empress. But now it seemed impossible. Peter the Great angrily tore the edict to pieces and spat on Ekaterina's face. He declared that not only would Ekaterina not be an empress, but she would not even be queen. After dealing with Ekaterina, Pete's condition worsened and it collapsed in a coma. 
Elizabeth was unaware of this major change in history. She was still naively thinking about romance. When Elizabeth learned it, that Baturin had been injured in the duel, she was furious at the guard's childish behavior. She punishes the guards, and then goes in disguise to check on Baturin's condition. Elizabeth said that Peter the Great was going to marry her to Carl, but she only loved Baturin, so she wants to run away with Baturin. But Baturin refuses Elizabeth, and says that a guard and a princess can't be together. Elizabeth leaves Baturin's room in tears, leaving a piece of jewelry behind. Baturin picks up the jewelry on the floor, and holds it in his hand to remember his first love. Elizabeth went back to her room, sad and ready to accept the reality. But Peter the Great, who has just woken up from his coma, says that Elizabeth's engagement is off the table. Carl has changed his mind and has chosen Annette as his fiancée. Anna is so happy and excited that she kisses Peter the Great's hand. Peter the Great pushes her away and calls Elizabeth to him, whispering that he has other plans for her. He hoped Elizabeth would not refuse him. This confused Elizabeth. On the other side, Ekaterina, in captivity, is in a state of anxiety. It's not that she's afraid of losing the throne. She's just afraid that she'll lose everything and go to the guillotine. Then Peter the Great sent him a gift. It was the hat of her lover. It made Ekaterina vomit. She turned to her lover and confident Alex in horror. He said that was the only way they could go if they didn't want to go to the guillotine. He even gave his love rival's head a meaningful look. In that evening, Peter the Great had his close minister, Menshikov, write Elizabeth's last will and testament. Then he signed and sealed it with the king's seal, declaring it valid. I don't know whether it was because his wish had been fulfilled or for some other reason. Peter the Great lost his breath as soon as the seal was affixed. The death now ran through the palace. Elizabeth, unable to grieve, rushes to her bedchamber to see her father for the last time, but is stopped by a guard at the door. He said it was Ekaterina's order. Ekaterina was looking for Peter the Great's will, and wanted to know who would take over the throne and what would happen to her, but she couldn't find it. Elizabeth was shouting at the door. Ekaterina had to let Elizabeth in so they wouldn't suspect anything. Then she resumed her search for the edict, and then she let Elizabeth watch her husband die and his wife left. Peter the Great, the most powerful Tsar in Russian history, died with his cheating wife and her lover by his side, looking for the edict. <laughs> <laughs> Ekaterina was desperate to find the edict. Now Dolgorukov has decided to install Peter II, Peter the Great's grandson, and now there's an edict that they don't even know exists. These are all obstacles for Ekaterina to overcome, and yet she's turned her chambers upside down and still can't find the edict. Ekaterina turned to Elizabeth. It suddenly occurred to her that Elizabeth was the most likely successor. Ekaterina grabbed her hand and told her that Elizabeth was born to Peter the Great before she married him, that she was illegitimate and had no right to inherit and that Peter had been so angry before he died, that his impulsive will didn't count. She told Elizabeth to hand it over. She meant that the heir to the Russian throne could only be Ekaterina, but Elizabeth didn't know about the edict. In the end, it was a heartbreaking farce, and the edict never surfaced. Since Peter the Great had not decided on a successor, the senators had to choose one, but the senators were not of the same persuasion. Some of them favor Ekaterina, while others favor Peter II, Peter the Great's grandson. The only thing they all have in common is that they are either unwise or young, so they can make the senator regent. Almost all of them wanted to be regent, including Menshikov, who had the testament. He secretly gave it to Elizabeth to say that he would make a legitimate heir to the throne and that he would lead an army to crush any opposition. But Elizabeth was in a state of grief. Her father had just died, and she didn't want to worry about that. She asked Menshikov to leave the edict to her mother. Menshikov refused. He said seriously that if the edict reached Ekaterina, it would be destroyed. Menshikov, in order to cover up his regency ambitions, used grandiose excuses to lure Elizabeth to the throne. He even suggested that Ekaterina might have had something to do with Peter the Great's death. But these words irritated Elizabeth, who was already suffering from the loss of a loved one. She was furious and drove Menshikov away. I'd say Menshikov's a tough guy, too. If he couldn't be a regent, he had to be a powerful henchman. He quickly gave the edict to Ekaterina as a gesture of goodwill. He also said that Elizabeth knew about the edict and even came to him for it. But his loyalty to Ekaterina kept him lying about not knowing. Menshikov was trying to hide the fact that he was a traitor. With Menshikov's urging, Ekaterina soon became convinced that Elizabeth had betrayed her and needed to be eliminated. But for now, it's business as usual, now that they have the edict. Alex's immediate thought is to burn it, but the guards have sent word that the senator is contacting the military for a coup. That was a shock to Alex. The battle for the throne is still being waged by force. So instead of burning the edict, Alex told Ekaterina to hide it. If they lose, they'll use the edict to install the puppet Elizabeth on the throne. A chance to turn the tide. Then Alex rushed to the Praetorian Guard to try and rally the troops. The entire Russian palace was shrouded in the sound of war. Elizabeth's guards hear the news and rush to inform Elizabeth of a mutiny. No sooner had they spoken than there was the sound of footsteps outside the door. Elizabeth looked through the door and saw a large army gathering at the palace. Yeah! Yeah! 
Since Peter the Great's death, all the powers have been interested in the throne and have been actively recruiting armies to take it. At the same time, Elizabeth learned of the mutiny and watched in horror as the armies poured into the palace. But as the army heads for her mother's chambers, she forgets her fear of death and tries to stop them. Covered by three guards, Elizabeth stood in front of the rebels. But the rebels were too many and they were forced to retreat. In the nick of time, Menshikov came out of the army. It turns out they weren't there to kill Ekaterina, but rather Menshikov's army of supporters. Then Elizabeth moves out of the way and tells the three guards to put down their weapons. Foolishly, Elizabeth is always thinking of her mother, not realizing that she wants to kill her for the throne. Soon the palace is filled with the sound of fighting. Moments later, Ekaterina surrounds the Senate with her troops. The senators are panicked by the sudden arrival of the rebels. They're not ready yet. The senators were outraged at the almost commanding words. They are now the opposite of their former arrogance in deciding the fate of the nation. Under Ekaterina's forceful gaze, there are those who have given in and shouted, Long live Ekaterina. With the first one leading the way, the rest of them also shouted, Long live Ekaterina. Ekaterina couldn't hide her smile of excitement when she saw that everyone had conceded. Her dream of becoming an empress had finally come true. At this moment, she and even the Praetorian Guard didn't realize that the next few successors would not be without the Praetorian Guard's coup d'etat, especially since the Praetorians would be assisting another empress, also named Ekaterina, to take the throne years later. Ekaterina has now finally become an empress and has begun her two-year reign. However, this new empress doesn't seem to have the political savvy to match. Her supporters proposed the abolition of the previous antagonistic senate and the creation of a new obedient senate and that this Senate would have only a fraction of the power. The bulk of the power should go to the Privy Council, which would be organized later. The members of the Privy Council would be chosen by their cronies and would only follow Ekaterina's orders. Ekaterina thought it made sense and followed their advice. However, these cronies were ultimately elected by them. Her power was taken away from her by both of them. In addition to that, they advised Ekaterina to dispose of the posthumous edicts so as not to give anyone else a chance to take over. But Ekaterina opens the safe in which the edict was hidden and finds it empty. I won't. Ekaterina's first suspicion was that Osterman had it. After all, they were the only three people who knew about the edict. Osterman realized who would benefit from the disappearance of the edict that proved his innocence. It had to be Elizabeth. Ayer. So he turned the tables on Elizabeth. With Ostromus scheming analysis, Ekaterina is convinced that Elizabeth is up to something and she is ready to kill her. At this point, Ekaterina had forgotten that a rival for the throne had fought off the rebels with her small, frail body and now she's trying to dispose of her daughter. Elizabeth, because she's suspicious of power, I can only say that royalty, which thrives on power, has never been family friendly. The Empress arrived in her daughter's room in a rage and saw a most erotic scene. The Empress, a frequent adulterer, was enraged at Elizabeth's unruly behavior. She had the churn put in a cell to await execution, but what infuriated Ekaterina most was that this seemingly harmless daughter had stolen the edict and tried to usurp the throne. Although the edict stated that Elizabeth was to be the successor, she was in fact the usurper. Ekaterina slapped Elizabeth across the face. <laughs> But Elizabeth doesn't know what the edict is, so no matter how much Ekaterina beat her, Elizabeth couldn't produce the edict. In the end, Ekaterina could only leave in anger. Ekaterina began to wonder if Elizabeth really didn't have the edict, and where did it go? Osterman and Menshikov say that regardless of whether Elizabeth has the edict or not, they have to be prepared for it to appear out of nowhere, so they can't let their guard down against Elizabeth. Secondly, Elizabeth has the legitimacy of the edict. But Elizabeth can't be the empress if she's eliminated. Osterman offered to get in touch with Baturin in prison. First, he could keep tabs on Elizabeth's every move. Secondly, Baturin could compel Elizabeth to elope or something to ruin Elizabeth's reputation. Ekaterina grinned at the idea of someone trying to frame her daughter. Then Osterman arranged Baturin and offered him three ways out. The first was to help Ekaterina deal with Elizabeth. The second was to confiscate his tools of the trade for insulting the princess and spend the rest of his life in prison. And the third was to be taxidermied. Under Osterman's oppression, Batarisen resisted only a few times before becoming Osterman's henchman. Baturin approached Elizabeth and told her he was released from prison because Osterman wanted him to spy on her. And he agreed, but Osterman didn't realize he was in love with Elizabeth. So Baturin was actually a double agent. Baturin got Elizabeth's trust to spy on her by telling nine truths and one lie. It seems that their sweet first love is nothing in the face of death. It was the day Elizabeth's sister, Anna, became engaged to Duke Carl. 
It is worth mentioning that Duke Karl was the biological father of Peter III, the husband of the famous Catherine the Great. Peter III hated Russia because he was forced to become a Russian puppet crown prince when he could have been king of Sweden. Elizabeth came to see her sister-in-law and his family off and to try to make peace with her mother. But as soon as Ekaterina saw Elizabeth, she began to humiliate her and forced her to leave. She looks at her daughter's back and feels no guilt. Instead, she asked Osterman about Maturin's work spying on Elizabeth. Elizabeth left the meeting under the mistaken impression that her mother was estranged because of the edict. If she could find the edict, her mother wouldn't hold it against her. The three guards quickly pinpointed Osterman as their target and prepared to check out his mansion, but Bachirin accidentally caught them in the act. The guards instinctively tried to hide the plan, but Elizabeth said they didn't have to because she trusted Bachirin. And when Bachirin found out what was going on, he said he'd been to Osterman's house so he could draw them a map. But would Bachirin be so kind? The three guards disguised as nuns and brought a basket of food to the Osterman's house to sell in order to steal from him. They managed to sneak into the Osterman's house by tricking him. The three guards mocked the servants for not being able to tell they were men. But the next moment, two guns were pointed at the two guards. Then a large number of guards poured into the room. The three idiots panicked, but quickly realized Osterman was prepared. They weren't just unlucky enough to see him come back. They were caught in a trap. Someone betrayed them. Osterman tied them up and sent them to the Privy Council to be tortured to find out who was behind it all. This made the three men realize that whether they betrayed Elizabeth or not, their presence in the Privy Council as her personal guards would be detrimental to Elizabeth. Seaguard puts down the food as if to admit defeat, but secretly winks at his teammates. The Seaguard then throws the vegetable basket at the guards and start a scuffle. I have to say, the three guards don't look smart, but they're a bit of a force to be reckoned with. They were able to kill a couple of guards and escape with their bare hands while everyone else had guns. Of course, the guard was wounded, they ran into the street, the guards were still in hot pursuit, and then they met Elizabeth's best friend, Princess Yusupovne. Yusupovne immediately told them to get into the carriage and hide while she distracted the pursuers. The pursuing guards and Yusupovne look at each other and leave without suspecting anything. Under Yusupovne's cover, the three guards hid in Yusupovne's apothecary shop and nursed the B-guard's wounds. Nevertheless, Osterman reported the incident to Ekaterina. This starlet Ekaterina, she suspected that Elizabeth had sent someone to infiltrate Osterman's mansion for some reason. So Ekaterina went to Elizabeth and told her about the three guards. She said that when she captured the three guards, she would torture them to find out what Elizabeth was up to. She's trying to trick Elizabeth to see if she can get to her weaknesses. Elizabeth was worried about the safety of the three guards, so she told the Empress the whole story. Unfortunately, her suspicion of her daughter grew because of the posthumous edict. Ekaterina didn't believe her and left because she thought Elizabeth was up to something. After Ekaterina left, Elizabeth's maid, Mia, defected to Osterman. She said that if Osterman gave up his pursuit of the B-guard, then she'd be watching Elizabeth's every move. Mia also suspects that Elizabeth has the edict, and who wouldn't want a personal spy? Osterman lied about sparing the B-guard and accepted Mia's surrender. The two kings fought each other on the suspicion that the other had the edict, but the French ambassador who really has the edict, is happily watching the show. It turns out that on the day of Elizabeth's coup, Elizabeth put the edict in the safe and the doctor saw it. The doctor had been acting as a spy for the French. So he took the edict when everyone wasn't looking and sold it to the French ambassador for money. Looking at the edict, which could destabilize Russia, the French ambassador came up with a sinister plan. Both Elizabeth and Ekaterina would fall victim to it. Since the death of Peter the Great, France, which had been stirring up trouble in Russia, found another opportunity to tame Russia. The French ambassador, in possession of the edict, had a spy doctor compel Elizabeth to travel to France to prepare for the throne. France would then use Elizabeth, the puppet empress, as the fulcrum to take control of the Russian royal family and then Russia. But what the French didn't realize was that Elizabeth was not her mother Ekaterina, who had ambition but not the political skills to match. No matter how much the French spy doctor compelled Elizabeth, she realized that she had no desire for power. The second is that she understands that the French intentions are not good. The price for her becoming king is, at worst, a cession of territory. And thirdly, how could she, as Peter the Great's daughter and a Russian princess, commit an act of treason that would live in infamy? So Elizabeth drove the doctor away 
and told Bachurin to deliver the French spy to the Empress. But Bachurin didn't do it. After all, as Osterman's henchman, he was in no position to make decisions. Bachurin told Osterman about it. Osterman was going to stay put. If they killed the doctor, the French would send new spies. Searching for new spies would be a time-consuming and labor-intensive endeavor. And Osterman suspected that the reason the French were compelling Elizabeth was because they had the edict. So Osterman ordered Bachurin to approach the French as a traitor and help them compel Elizabeth to go to Paris. Then Osterman captures them at the harbor and finds out if they have the edict. With any luck, he'll be able to take Elizabeth and the edict in one fell swoop. And if that doesn't work out, it's not a bad idea to make Elizabeth out to be a traitor. But Jurin is not happy. If Osterman doesn't save him later, he'll be executed for murdering the princess and trees. Osterman senses his thoughts and reminds him that he's just a guard who's guilty of a crime. And if he doesn't want to die, he'll have to do as he's told. But Jurin is furious, but he does as he's told. He knew that he was like one of these specimens that Osterman had collected because he was useful. If he wasn't useful, Osterman would destroy him immediately. When Bachurin returned to the palace, he couldn't wait to compel Elizabeth to elope. He deliberately avoided mentioning France as his destination so that Elizabeth wouldn't realize what he was really up to. To increase his leverage, Bachurin offers marriage as a lure. Love struck Elizabeth immediately agrees to Bachurin's elopement. But she had to wait because she was worried about the safety of the three guards. As soon as the three guards returned safely, she would run away with Bachurin. Bachurin didn't dare to push her too hard for fear of being exposed. So he had to listen to her. And so the elopement plan was put on hold. Sometimes plans change. When Osterman's staff learned it of the plan, they pointed out the flaw in Elizabeth's treason plan. If Bachurin's mutiny really did take Elizabeth to France, Elizabeth would be a restored empress with a testament in her hand. Bachurin could become a general and no longer be under Osterman's control. And if the restoration succeeds, Elizabeth won't let go of Osterman, who has betrayed her repeatedly. Osterman hasn't been targeting Elizabeth because he wants to impress a Katerina. He just wants to get rid of Elizabeth because he's afraid of being liquidated for betraying her. Although Ekaterina was repeatedly compelled to kill her daughter, she didn't really want to. However, when Osterman fell out with Elizabeth, he wanted to kill her for real. Osterman then realized that he could not pin his hopes on Bachurin, who might defect at will. Osterman immediately set out to find Duke Yusupov, Yusupov Ney's father, in hopes of forming an alliance with him. Ekaterina's reign is too vulnerable until Elizabeth and her legacy are removed. The powerful Menshikov has already approached Peter II. Osterman needs allies, too. After a bit of a conniving collusion, Osterman reveals that Elizabeth is there apparent on the edict. The successor to the throne is not from Yusupov's camp, and she's a girl. This upsets Duke Yusupov, who is particularly patriarchal and ambitious. He even tried to poison Elizabeth, so Yusupov sneaked into Yusupov Ney's pharmacy and took a very small bottle of poison and gave it to Osterman, and told him to poison Elizabeth, but the scene of him getting the poison was seen by Yusupov Ney and the three guards, knowing that the potion was poison. The three guards decided to break into the palace to protect Elizabeth. Yusupov Ney stopped them. Now that the three of them are wanted, they'd be doing themselves a disservice. Finally, they decided on a plan. They leave in a carriage, while Duke Yusupov sleeps and split up. Yusupov Ney took the antidote and went to rescue Elizabeth. The three guards would find a place to hide. If that situation changes, they will be able to meet them. On the other hand, Osterman has begun his poisoning program. A bowl of poison, which can kill an elephant, was poured into a cup of coffee by the maid. The coffee was to be delivered to Crown Princess Elizabeth. Elizabeth took her usual sip of coffee, but as soon as she took a sip, she felt dizzy as if she had seen her dead father. Peter the Great. Luckily, Yusupov Ney arrived in time to give Elizabeth the antidote. Lisa, Lisa. The maid who administered the poison realized the plan had failed and rushed to inform Osterman's butler. The butler rushed home to tell Osterman that Yusupov Ney had ruined the plan. Don't. Yusupov Ney's presence meant that Osterman's identity as the poisoner was revealed. However, Osterman soon realized that while assassinating the princess was a capital crime, Duke Yusupov was the one who poisoned her. Yusupov Ney would have covered up for her father. Duke Yusupov? So even if Ekaterina knew about it, what could she do with him without proof? Let the poisoner, Duke Yusupov, take care of it. Then Osterman sent the butler to inform Duke Yusupov. Duke Yusupov is also furious. Even Osterman had to bow to him. And now, a butler is telling him what to do. And Osterman was trying to clear his name and let him take the blame. Duke Yusupov decided that when he had the chance, he would cut Osterman into pieces. The two cunning foxes were trying to blame each other. But what they didn't realize was that the princess had no intention of taking revenge. Osterman was her mother's most trusted man. Duke Yusupov was the father of her best friend and savior. Whoever she seeks to avenge will end up hurting the people she holds dear. Elizabeth decides to take the loss for the sake of her precious relationship. But her mother, Ekaterina, never knew. Now Ekaterina is enjoying a life of wealth, from commoner's daughter to empress of a nation. When Elizabeth has recovered, Yusupov Ney informed her of the location. 
of the three guards and relay their suspicions. They suspected that Baturin had betrayed them. Unfortunately, women in love are blind, no matter how justified Yusupovne's suspicions were. Elizabeth did not believe that her lover would betray her. Instead, knowing that the three guards were safe, she decided to run away with Baturin the day after tomorrow. This shocking decision further inflames the situation. Osterman ordered Baturin to carry out his plan. He will find a way to help them escape from the palace, but he has to get the French spy, Elizabeth, and they eat it all by himself. At the same time, Yusupovne informs the three guards of the news. They feel that they can let Elizabeth leave. There must be a plot. But the question is, who can stop the decision of a girl in love? So the three guards decided to follow Elizabeth as she left and see what happened. Just as they were about to leave, Osterman's men came searching. Since Yusupovne rescued the princess, Osterman suspected that she was in contact with the three guards. So he sent his men to follow Yusupovne. Although the three guards escaped, Yusupovne was caught. Osterman sent her home so that Duke Yusupov could teach his rebellious daughter a lesson. Yusupovne was beaten up miserably. A few days later, Elizabeth was finally ready to elope. She asked her mate, Mia, to deliver a letter to her mother. In the letter, Elizabeth told her mother that she had no interest in the throne, and she hoped that her mother would not jeopardize her relationship with her daughter through suspicion. To this end, Elizabeth enclosed a document stating that Elizabeth would renounce her right to the throne. Once Ekaterina had proclaimed it, Elizabeth would be a usurper, no matter how she came to the throne. But Mia gave the letter to Osterman, and Osterman burned the letter without reading it in order to secretly kill his sworn enemy, Elizabeth. The next morning, Elizabeth and Baturin left the palace in the fog. The three guards, who had been waiting for them, followed them secretly. Ekaterina soon learned it of Elizabeth's elopement. In fact, Ekaterina had known for some time about Elizabeth's attempt to run away in Osterman's actions. She just didn't know the circumstances surrounding it. Ekaterina suddenly realized that Osterman might betray her. So they went to Osterman and asked him about it to test his loyalty. And Osterman keeps deflecting with the fact that Elizabeth is going to commit treason and go to Paris, and that he's already got men on the ground to capture her. He doesn't say why he's condoning Elizabeth's trip to Paris. This confirms Ekaterina's and Menshikov's suspicions that Osterman is a traitor without a word of truth. Menshikov realizes that Elizabeth's trip to Paris may be more than just treason, but Osterman is running the show. So Menshikov sends Shubin to retrieve the traitor Elizabeth and secretly give her a certain scroll. Although he didn't understand why Elizabeth had become a traitor, Shubin set out with his men, but during the three guards, the French, and Menshikov's troops are all on Elizabeth's trail. How can Elizabeth overcome such a dangerous situation? The guard undresses Princess Elizabeth in a remote inn. He slides his fingers over her skin to experience the beauty of Europe's first beauty. At the same time, Elizabeth's admirer, Garde, crouched at the window and pretended to sleep to calm himself down. A minute later, the three guards found Baturin walking out, refreshed, and followed by a man. The man said that the carriages, the ships, and the testament were ready for France. Tomorrow morning the men will escort them both to Paris. France, the king of France will reward Baturin. Garde is almost certain that Baturin is a spy, trying to trick Elizabeth into going to France as a puppet. They have to find a way to save Elizabeth, but Garde C also had his doubts. If Elizabeth really wants to go to France as a traitor, should they follow her? Garde was suddenly speechless. They didn't dare to think about it. The next day, Garde sneaks into the hotel when Baturin is not looking to see Elizabeth and takes her away. Elizabeth is so happy to see Garde A safe and sound that she jumps up and down and tries to take him away. Guard A asks her tentatively if she will take the edict to France and fight her way back to Russia to become king. Elizabeth is puzzled. What France? What edict? She doesn't know anything. Guard A is about to explain what's going on when Bajuran suddenly appears. He has said that Guard A betrayed them and wanted to take Elizabeth back to Russia. So he started to attack Guard A. Guard A had to fight back with his sword. They fight and explain. Both of them said that the other betrayed Elizabeth. This confused Elizabeth. While the two men were at a standstill, the Frenchman knocked Guard A out from behind. Elizabeth rushes up to check on Garde, but Baturin stops her. <laughs> At that moment, all the lies pale into insignificance. Elizabeth realizes she's been lied to. Elizabeth was dragged to the carriage by Baturin for Garde A's safety. The other two guards outside the door, realizing that the plan had failed, drew their guns and attacked Baturin in an attempt to save Elizabeth. <laughs> A fierce battle broke out between the two sides. The two guards. Though intent on killing the traitor, were powerless to do so, they could only watch as Elizabeth was taken away. Then Guard A woke up and came out of the room trembling. When he learned that the princess had been taken away, he immediately mounted his horse and prepared to go after her. But then, in a comedic twist, Shubin's men arrived. Since the three guards are now wanted, Shubin and his men surrounded them. So Guard A could only tell Shubin that the princess had been robbed. Shubin was nervous and ordered one person to stay behind to guard the three guards, while the others went with him to rescue the princess. On the other hand, Elizabeth asked Baturin why he betrayed her with tears in his eyes. Baturin had no explanation and could not explain. 
The carriage was not as fast as the horse. Shubin soon caught up with him. The Praetorians, with their superior fighting skills, quickly disposed of the French. Baturin was the only remaining enemy. They were ready to swarm over Baturin. But Baturin was not stupid. He grabbed Elizabeth as a hostage and told them to step back and put down all their weapons. Since the princess is in Baturin's hands, Shubin and the others didn't dare to do anything, so they had to follow Baturin's orders and be subjected to him. They watched Baturin escape. After Baturin left, Shubin found the scroll that Minchikov wanted on the Frenchman's body. His next task was to return with a scroll in Elizabeth. On the way back, Elizabeth stared at the sea alone. Everything that had happened to her recently came to her mind. She couldn't understand why everyone, even her mother Ekaterina, would not let her go when all she wanted to do was to live her life in peace and quiet. Was power really so important? Power turns kind uncles into scoundrels. It made a loving mother so cold and heartless. The answer to that question is what Shubin wants to know. He was there the day the Praetorian Guard installed Ekaterina on the throne. Elizabeth fought them off alone. Her kind and brave face stuck in his mind. Shubin couldn't believe Elizabeth would commit treason. He asked Elizabeth what had happened. Elizabeth smiled helplessly and said it was all her father Peter the Great's fault for making her his heir. If Shubin wants to know the answer, he should open the scroll they found. Shubin opens the scroll and reads Peter the Great's edict and learns a great deal about what happened. Shubin swore an oath of allegiance to Elizabeth. The Praetorian Guard is Peter the Great's champion. He will honor Peter the Great's edict and support Elizabeth in defeating the usurper. But Elizabeth still didn't want to take the throne or face the ugly side of power. But what Elizabeth didn't realize was that her desire to protect her loved ones had led to the death of more of them. The infidel Russian Empress suddenly feels someone touching her behind her back. She turned around to see that there was nothing there. But when she turned back around, she was almost scared to death. Peter the Great was sitting right in front of her. Ekaterina was so frightened that she couldn't speak and begged her husband for forgiveness. But Peter the Great wouldn't say anything, but pointed to the name of his heir. Elizabeth, on the edict, Ekaterina knew her husband blamed her for being blinded by power and for destroying her daughter. And how could she not blame herself? Just this morning, Elizabeth was taken back to the palace by Shubin. Ekaterina thought she'd have to torture her Elizabeth to get her to hand over the edict. But Elizabeth voluntarily handed over the edict and told her mother to keep it safe and that she had no intention of taking over the throne. Ekaterina looked at her daughter with suspicion, but Elizabeth's eyes were full of sincerity and care for her mother. This made Ekaterina's senses return to her, and she wondered if she'd been tricked. So she orders everyone to leave the room and leaves Shubin alone to talk. Moments later, Ekaterina learns what happened to Elizabeth and realizes that she was lied to from the beginning. Although she loves power like a poor person does after suddenly becoming rich, she is still a mother, and Michiko never left because he was afraid Ekaterina would forgive Elizabeth, so he stayed to seize the opportunity. When Ekaterina told him about her conversation with Shubin, Menshikov began to denigrate Elizabeth and talk about how she was going to be. And that's when Ekaterina realized what Menshikov was like. Not only was he a snob to her, but he wanted to take over her power as regent. And if she gets in his way, he'll never let her go. Ekaterina felt guilty when she realized the truth. The people who hurt her like crazy were treated like treasures, but those who really cared for her, she hated and wanted to kill. Ekaterina saw a vision of Peter the Great when she was drunk. Ekaterina apologized and confessed as if she had seen someone she could rely on. In the end, she saw Peter the Great pointing to the edict and realized what he meant. He was asking her to return the throne to Elizabeth. Ekaterina didn't refuse and turned around and went to her daughter's bedroom. Elizabeth was having nightmares that Baturin was stabbing her. Elizabeth, who was being suffocated, woke up from her dream and scared Ekaterina. She reassures her daughter that it's all right. Mom's here. Then she told Elizabeth of her purpose. She intends to announce Elizabeth as the heir to the throne at the next meeting of the Privy Council and to arrest Menshikov and Osterman. At the same time, she begged her daughter to forgive her and stay with her to run the country. Those powerful officials are evil spirits, and Ekaterina is a commoner who got here through Peter the Great's favor. She was no match for the powerful. The dutiful Elizabeth chose to forgive and make a true reconciliation with her mother. But she refuses to be a regent, saying that she just wants to live in peace with her friends in the countryside. Ekaterina had to ask her daughter if she could bear to see her being bullied. Would she like to see Peter the Great's country fall into the hands of powerful men? And she warned her that Elizabeth was Peter the Great's direct descendant. Whether she wants to be emperor or not, or whether she has a will or not, all those who want to be emperor will see Elizabeth as a rival and will try to kill her. Elizabeth could either die or win the battle for the throne. There was no third option. At her mother's pleading, Elizabeth says she will reconsider. No sooner had the Empress left than the three guards came to see Elizabeth. They had been released from prison because of the reconciliation between mother and daughter. They came to Elizabeth to ask for help. Guard B had fallen in love with Yusupovne, who had treated his wounds while he was on the run. But Yusupovne cured Elizabeth's poison and repeatedly sabotaged Duke Yusupov's plans. So Duke Yusupov imprisoned Yusupovne and tried to marry her off to a scoundrel. 
They want Elizabeth to help them get guard B to meet Yusupovne at her engagement party. Elizabeth, of course, agrees, and then tells the three guards what she has just experienced. Elizabeth can't decide whether to take the throne or go into seclusion. This time, both guard A and the other two guards, who like Elizabeth, say that no matter what path Elizabeth chooses, no matter what identity Elizabeth chooses to live in, they will live and die with her. However, none of them realized that their conversation was overheard by Mia. Mia, who had always been in love with guard B, became a spy who betrayed Elizabeth to protect him, but all her efforts only resulted in guard B's betrayal. Mia became even more vicious and reported Elizabeth's conversation to Osterman. Knowing the situation was bad, Osterman approached Menshikov to discuss what to do. V, Menshikov and Osterman set up a plan. They take advantage of the fact that tomorrow, while Princess Anna is traveling with her husband and Elizabeth is going to Yusupov Mi's wedding, they will surround the palace with their troops and stage a coup d'etat to kill Lake Katerina. Then they'll set up an ambush to kill Elizabeth on her way back to the palace when she gets the message. Once the obstacles are out of the way, they will enthrone Peter the Great's grandson at the age of 12, and then they will go on to become the regent and take over. Once the plan was agreed upon, Menshikov went to the barracks to mobilize troops. Osterman went to contact Dukusipov and the others. He wanted to get everyone on board to support Peter II's rise to power. The wheels of intrigue began to turn. Ekaterina was in the middle of writing an edict, declaring Elizabeth the heir apparent. But then she hears a noise at her door. She opens the door to find that Menshikov has surrounded the palace with his soldiers to kill her. The man grabbed the Russian empress by the hair and poured the poison into her mouth. Ekaterina felt like she was being burned by fire and couldn't see a thing. Immediately after, Menshikov, a powerful courtier, offered Ekaterina an antidote to the poison and forced her to sign a decree of abdication to give the throne to Peter II. Under half coercion and half voluntarily, Ekaterina signed a posthumous decree instead of a decree of abdication. Without seeing anything, with the edict signed, Menshikov pours another vial of poison into Ekaterina. At this moment, Elizabeth is still in the euphoria of Guard B and Yusupovne's confirmed love. But suddenly, she receives the news that Ekaterina is critically ill. Elizabeth rushes back to the palace without hesitation, but is ambushed by criminals on the way. Faced with the sudden attack and well-trained criminals, Elizabeth and her team are at a disadvantage for a while. Fortunately, Shubin came to their aid and they were able to win. Afterwards, Shubin told Elizabeth not to go back to the palace, and his son Menchikov mysteriously mobilizing his army and followed them out, only to find out that they were here to assassinate Elizabeth. Menchikov must have set up an ambush on the road ahead. If they returned to the palace, they'd be doomed. But Elizabeth didn't hesitate to fight her way back to the palace to see how her mother was doing. When Elizabeth saw her mother, Ekaterina, she was already dying. Ekaterina wanted to tell her daughter the truth, but she couldn't speak because she was so poisoned. With a look in her eyes, Elizabeth knew that her mother was trying to tell her to watch out for Menchikov and Osterman, the two men who killed her. It was as if mother and daughter were connected. Ekaterina was sure of her daughter's intentions and lost her breath ending her two-year reign as Empress. A heartbroken Elizabeth rises and denounces Menshikov as a traitor. <laughs> Menshikov hears this with a mocking expression. He doesn't want to talk too much, because now the situation is settled. He then proclaimed Ekaterina's edict that Peter would be the next emperor, and then he walked away with arrogance. But even the arrogant enemies and the death of her parents didn't exactly inspire Elizabeth to fight for the throne. Elizabeth was indifferent to her nephew Peter becoming emperor. She just didn't want to see her parents' work fall into Menshikov's hands. So she turns to her sister, Anna, for help and to join forces with her to save Russia. Elizabeth explained that Peter II was about to take the throne when his father was killed for treason. Peter's family was exiled and he had very little background. And Peter II was only 12 years old, so he couldn't control the powerful officials. Now it was up to the sisters to keep the powerful in check and protect Peter the Great's country. But Anna almost hissed. Father's edict was that you succeed to the throne. And mother's edict is that you succeed to the throne. Am I an extra in this family? Was I picked up from the trash? Her parents and Elizabeth don't treat her as family, so Anna won't treat them as family either. Anna was going back to Sweden with her husband, Dukal, to live an ordinary life and raise her children. And she was taking her mate, Mia, with her, and then she turned right around and left. But I think it would be a good thing for Elizabeth if she did take Mia. That's why, now that her sister doesn't care about the kingdom her father left behind, it's all up to Elizabeth. But the question is, how can they stop Menshikov from becoming regent when they have no power? That's when Shubin said he had a solution, but he needed the help of the three guards. Shubin's plan was simple, get Elizabeth into the Privy Council and use the minister's interests to implode in order to win. In a meeting of the Russian Supreme Council, the ministers are arguing over the position of regent. And Elizabeth, who started it all, is sneakering as she watches these powerful ministers being manipulated by her on the plan to stop Menshikov from becoming regent. Shubin said that Menshikov had contacted all of his ministers to recommend Peter II as a puppet emperor, but that it was only a temporary alliance. 
They will fight over who will be regent afterward. And Minshikov is sure he can become regent and stage a coup because he's convinced Osterman will support him. So Shubin and the three guards will try to keep Osterman out of the meeting so that there will only be six ministers from both factions. And when the vote is tied, the ministers will implode in favor of each other. And then there will be Elizabeth's turn. And as Shubin thought, the privy councillors are eager to share the cake. Or perhaps they want to take advantage of the tie and start dividing the cake without waiting for Osterman to arrive. These ministers were divided into two groups, Duke Yusupov's and Duke Menchikov's. But because of the tiebreaker, neither of them could become regent. So they had to yell at each other. The situation has come to such a pass that it troubles Menchikov. He worked so hard to become regent that he even committed regicide. And he almost made Duke Yusupov regent. What is this? With both sides pretty much at loggerheads, Elizabeth popped up with a suggestion. They're all doing this to help the emperor rule anyway. So why don't the Privy Council become regents together? With this suggestion, Duke Yusupov and Menshikov were against it. Especially Menshikov. Menshikov didn't want to share his power with Duke Yusupov, let alone with the Privy Council. And what difference would there be between an equal division of power and the previous elections? But that's the insidious thing about this plan. They didn't want it, but the other ministers did. The other ministers thought they'd just escort the boss, applaud him, and then go home and become his subordinates. But now they can actually get the power of the regent although it's still the same as the election, and the ministers are still subordinates. But now that they've got the title of regent, it's not impossible for them to become the master of the house. And here's the kicker, if I can't be the regent, then neither can you as my rival. All party loyalty is hypocritical when it comes to profit. The chancellor was quick to agree with Elizabeth's suggestion that they could all be regents. As Elizabeth said, we're all trying to help the king, so does it matter what we are? Is it hard to believe that someone is trying to monopolize power and bully the monarch by overriding it? Of course the Chancellor also said that we are all temporary regents, preparing for the next soul power with the Chancellor laying the groundwork. One by one, the powerful ministers raised their hands in approval. Menshikov, though reluctant, could only raise his hand in favor. After all, he can't change anything if all the ministers except him agree. If he raises his hand, he'll make a good impression. Thanks to Elizabeth's planning, the Russian Empire was saved for the time being. But Elizabeth's calculations are essentially a borrowing of power. Because at this point, she's powerless. If she wants to save the situation, she has to find a way to increase her political power, in addition to her status as a princess. On the other hand, Menshikov, who couldn't take the reins of power, was planning to take Peter II home as a hostage. At the age of 12, Peter made his entrance into history. He was the last of the Romanov dynasty's direct paternal heirs. Theirs was also the most prosperous and purest generation of the dynasty. At 12, Peter's innocence was not easily lulled into a struggle for power. So Menshikov set his sights on his sister Natalia. He showed Natalia Peter the great and Ekaterina's will, and then said that Elizabeth was the rightful heir to the throne. If Peter II is left in the palace, Elizabeth will find a way to kill Peter and overthrow him as usurper. Peter II's family would be exiled and even killed. And Natalia, who was already in competition for power, agreed to let Menshikov bring Peter II home. When Elizabeth finds out, she accuses Natalia of being out of her mind. Menshikov is the one who will really hurt Peter II if it takes him hostage. How could she hurt her nephew Peter? But Natalia says there's no family in power. Peter the Great killed her father. Ekaterina even tried to hurt her daughter Elizabeth. Which of these is not a real-life example of a parent killing their children for power? Elizabeth was speechless for a moment, not bothering to question Natalia's behavior, and began to think about how to take Peter II back, the 12-year-old. Boy had just ascended to the throne and fell in love with his own aunt. When she bowed to him, he looked where he shouldn't have, as if he'd discovered a new world. This daring boy is Peter II, grandson of Peter the Great and his ex-wife, the third king of the Romanov dynasty in Russia. His love for Elizabeth was complex, and it included a love of Elizabeth's beauty. More importantly, of course, is the fact that when Ivan tries to take Peter II from Menshikov's residence with his soldiers, and the two groups of men are at war over his safety, Elizabeth steps forward to protect Peter and take him to safety. Elizabeth's valiant and brave behavior attracts Peter II. Peter of the II's parents were killed for treason. History will judge their merits and demerits. But at the age of three, Peter was orphaned and became dependent on his sister, not Alia. Peter is a bit of love starved, and due to this lack of maternal love, he has a bit of an edible complex. So, he naturally developed a paranoid love for his aunt, who was very beautiful and determined to protect him. In ancient times, it was normal for royal families to have inbreeding marriages, so Peter II doesn't think it's outrageous for him to marry his aunt, and even subconsciously ignores the fact that they're too close. Peter is nothing less than a bold child. He's so paranoid about his love for Elizabeth that he dares to kiss her in public. He'd kill any man who came close to Elizabeth. When he couldn't kill the three guards or Shubin, Peter moved them thousands of miles to the frontier. At 12 years old, Peter wasn't very bright. He thought he was the supreme Russian emperor, so he could have whatever he wanted and no one could deny him. As Peter II pursued his love, not Alia, 
the only sister who loved him, suffered. She worked hard to keep Peter II on the throne, so she chose to make an alliance with a powerful Michikov to keep Elizabeth in check. However, nothing she could do would change Peter II's behavior in trusting a rival. Natalia had to turn her mind to compelling Ivan, the son of the powerful Dolgorukov, and joining forces with his family as a way to counter Menshikov. Ivan's family is a tough bunch, to say the least. Ivan took Menshikov by surprise and surrounded his residence with his troops. He forced Menshikov to hand over the edict and write a confession. At first, Menshikov tried to resist, so Ivan grabbed Menshikov's daughter. It threatened Menshikov that if he didn't cooperate, he'd have to make the soldiers line up to serve his daughter. Under Ivan's pressure, Menshikov had to hand over the edictal and sign a confession of guilt, announcing his downfall. Dolgorukov's faction, although they used the capturing the ringleader first in order to capture all the followers method to get rid of Menshikov's forces, did not dare to push them too hard, but in the end, they only put Menshikov in jail. In the end, the Menshikovs were exiled to Siberia. The fall of Menshikov marked the arrival of a new power, Dolgorukov. It's worth noting that Dolgorukov used to work closely with Yusupov against Menshikov. But once Dolgorukov became the first in power, he and Yusupov fought to the death again. That's the funny thing about politics. Dolgorukov took the same route as Menshikov when it came to power. He wanted to marry his daughter to Peter II and become the king's father-in-law. If Peter II died by accident, Dolgorukov will let his daughter replicate Ekaterina's rise to the throne and become an empress. And he'll be the overlord. No, However, Dolgorukov will soon realize Natalia's helplessness. He just tried to marry his daughter to Peter, only to find out that Peter was only interested in his sworn enemy, Elizabeth. Even though he wanted to do something great, he couldn't do it in the end. <laughs> Doesn't 13-year-old nephew know any better than his almost 20-year-old real aunt Elizabeth? She simply refused to go. Peter II was stood up and went on a drunken rampage to drown his sorrows. He kisses everyone he meets and curses everyone in his impotent rage. His loving sister, not Alia, in her anger and regret, could only comfort her only brother. In the days that followed, Peter's behavior became more and more exaggerated. His daily verbal displays of affection for Elizabeth were no big deal, and he spied on her as she changed her clothes. Elizabeth became increasingly frightened. She writes a farewell letter to Shubin and the three guards, and explains how much she misses them and how she is determined to die. If Peter the second dared to force her to marry, she would die to preserve order and the honor of the Russian Empire. Upon learning the news, the three guards fled towards Moscow, no longer heeding Peter the second's watchful eye. They either fought their pursuers, or took various detours on their way to Moscow. On Elizabeth's side, the tide seemed to be turning. The doctor, who was a French spy, and was forced by Menshikov to poison Ekaterina thinks he's gone against the rules of doctoring. So he came to Elizabeth to make amends for his crime, to help her fake a case of red speck disease. She'd be able to avoid Peter by claiming it was contagious. At first, her plan worked well, as no one dared to come near Elizabeth, and Peter II was prevented from coming near her. Elizabeth had a few easy days, but Peter II loved Elizabeth to death. Not only did he break out of the blockade to see Elizabeth, but he also saw Elizabeth pretending to be sick. Peter's anger at being lied to is so great that it exceeds the level of a hysterical roar. He takes the paint for the red speck disease and slowly applies it to Elizabeth's face. He said in a low voice that he had been orphaned at the age of three and was afraid to give love and hate being betrayed. Then Peter left in a half. This made Elizabeth feel guilty, but instead of announcing that he no longer liked Elizabeth because of her betrayal, Peter had an age-appropriate idea. You won't let me have you, but I will. He tries to get Elizabeth in any way he can. His sister, not Alia, advised him to stop after all. Concerning his marriages would tarnish Russia's image and give birth to monstrous children. But Peter the second wouldn't listen, caught up in his unrequited love. He doesn't even realize that his beloved sister's days are numbered. In the last two years, Peter's lack of background has prevented him from becoming a humiliating puppet. Thanks to Natalia's battles with the powerful officials, Natalia contracted a lung disease and coughed up blood, but she loved her brother too much to recover and continued to fight to protect his throne, and told the doctors to keep her illness a secret. She said that Peter had already lost his relatives, so she wanted him to be happy this time. She hoped he wouldn't be saddened to see her reach the end of her life. With this in mind, every time Natalia coughed up blood, she lied to Peter and told him it was just a cold. Peter, who was still trying to woo Elizabeth, didn't bother to find out what was wrong with his sister. And so the days went by. Dolgorukov soon heard about the crazy things Peter was doing to Elizabeth. He realized that as long as Elizabeth was alive, he would never be able to control the puppet emperor. So he decided to assassinate Elizabeth while Peter was out hunting. Time flies and it's hunting day. Peter was going to do something during the hunt at Elizabeth. And Dolgorukov is arranging assassins. Elizabeth's surroundings are full of danger. Luckily, the three guards have arrived at the hunt. Where will their presence lead to? 
The princess pointed her gun at the preys, but was surprised to find that they were actually living men. Peter II was wildly excited when he heard this. What he wanted to hunt was human beings. With the sound of a gunshot, a man's knees crumpled in agony and it fell to the ground. The sound of wailing echoed through the forest. But 15-year-old Peter II wasn't satisfied. He switches to another gun and prepares to kill the man. Elizabeth rushed to stop him, telling him not to do anything wrong. The sinister Peter said he wouldn't shoot if Elizabeth would give him one thing. What's my age? Peter II finally lowered his gun. He would do anything to get his hands on his own Aunt Elizabeth. What Elizabeth didn't realize was that while Peter's gun was pointed at her, an assassin was about to put a bullet in her chest. Fortunately, in the nick of time, Shubin is able to knock the assassin over and wrestle with him. After a fierce fight, they beat the assassin. But when they asked who sent the assassin, Ivan, the son of Dolgorukov, who was the culprit behind the attack, came to the scene and killed the assassin without a word. Well, now we don't have to ask who was behind it, we all know the answer. But Shubin and the others didn't blame Ivan because they still needed him. Instead, they wanted Ivan to tell Elizabeth that they were waiting for her deep in the woods. And Ivan, in an attempt to play nice, relayed the agreement for them. When Elizabeth found out and went to the location, Ivan told Dolgorukov about it. Dolgorukov said he did a good job, they'll send for Elizabeth right away, linking her to the three deserters and the assassin. He wants to create the illusion that Elizabeth is the Kingslayer and is going to assassinate Peter II. Then he'll try to take Elizabeth down. On the other hand, after catching up with Shubin and the three guards, it occurs to Elizabeth that they shouldn't be here as deserters. Elizabeth soon had a similar thought to Dolgorukov. Fearful of being counted out, Elizabeth decides to strike first. She approached Peter II and asked him to meet her in her bedroom. Thinking that his dream is about to come true, Peter agrees without hesitation. In Elizabeth's bedroom, Elizabeth chose to tell him everything. Peter was furious to learn that his beloved and had almost died. The time was right. Elizabeth said that Shubin and the three guards were her saviors. She hoped Peter, the second would pardon them for desertion and let them return to protect her. Peter the second agreed to pardon them, but only the three guards could stay. Shubin had to go back to his quarters, because he can see that Elizabeth's gaze on Shubin is not innocent. Peter left Elizabeth's bedroom and found Dolgorukov and his son and beat them up. Peter told them that if they ever hurt Elizabeth again, he would destroy the Dolgorukov family. Dolgorukov was forced to apologize for being a vassal, but he hated Peter II with a passion. A few days later, news came to the palace that Natalia was dying of lung disease. Peter II hugged her tightly and begged her not to die. He told her that since he was a child, his sister was the only one who truly loved him and took care of him. He couldn't live without her. Peter talks about the hard times he spent with Natalia and tries to motivate her to survive. But in the face of merciless fate, no matter how touching their bond was, no matter how strong Natalia's will to live was, in the end, Natalia left this world. From then on, Peter II was truly alone. Without his sister Natalia to keep him in check, 15-year-old Peter became even more violent and crazy. Just a beggar said, he was attacked by a disease and his face was full of death. Peter disregarded the dignity and kicked him to vent his pent-up emotions. I don't know if it was the old beggar who got it right because Peter fell ill not long after he returned home. He was infected with smallpox and his days were numbered. This is an actual event in the history of the Russian Empire. The 15-year-old Emperor Peter II was forced by his courtier to marry on his deathbed. But that Peter II, like his grandfather Peter the Great, had no peace until the last moment of his life. Vanya. 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 His best friend, Ivan, couldn't even look up at him. After three years as emperor, 15-year-old Peter II did not wait to marry his Aunt Elizabeth. Instead, he waited for the day of his death. Infected with smallpox, Peter was immobilized in bed, one step away from death, in the powerful Dolgorukov. When he found out, planned to keep it a secret, he waited to use his title to gain power, before sending someone to collect Peter II's body. Dolgorukov ordered a news blackout and threatened to silence the doctor, to which the doctor agreed. Then the doctor turned away and told Elizabeth the news. Elizabeth didn't know what to do when she found out her nephew was dying. She could only plan to meet Peter II, but Dolgorukov had sealed off the bedchamber, so Elizabeth couldn't get in. Inside, Peter was obsessed with going to see Elizabeth every day. If he doesn't, Elizabeth will forget about him. Unfortunately, no one would let him out. The walls have years. The news that Peter had contracted smallpox became known. None of the powerful officials thought to visit Peter II, but continued to fight for power and territory. They were intent on keeping the next puppet king in the palm of their hands. Since the 15-year-old Peter II had nowhere, they searched the royal family for a successor to the throne. Even Elizabeth was offered a contract if she would appoint him regent and transfer all powers to him. The powerful ministers agreed to make Elizabeth their empress. 
How could Elizabeth agree to sign a contract that would almost give away her kingdom? She refused the minister's overtures. While the ministers were looking for puppets, Dolgorogov was the most outrageous. He wants his daughter to marry Peter and duplicate Ekaterina's rise to power. My god, Dolgorogov is so evil for the sake of the emperor and power. He didn't care that his son, Ivan, was on his knees pleading for his brother and sister to be spared, or his daughter's pleas. Dolgorokov put a wedding dress on his daughter and dragged her to the hospital room to marry Peter II. Peter was dying, but Dolgorokov didn't care. He then asked his subordinates to put the crown on Peter II. And of course his daughter was not left out. The daughter looked at her father with wide eyes. She couldn't understand why her father was so cruel. Perhaps because of a hallucination, Peter, lying in the hospital bed, thought it was Elizabeth and shouted Elizabeth's name frantically. But when he saw the reality of the situation in an instant, he cried out pleadingly to Ivan and hoped that this good friend would help him. But when it comes to friendship and family, Ivan chooses his father and his family. Peter could only cry out Elizabeth's name in desperation to see her before he died. But fate is merciless. Peter left this world without seeing Elizabeth before he died. After Peter's death, the powerful ministers didn't accept the legitimacy of this ridiculous way and didn't let Dolgorukov override them. After a long period of wrangling and compromise, it was agreed that in order for the puppet not to be able to rebel, the new king had to be a man of no background at all. Then the regent became the privy council. They all continued Elizabeth's routine, which was that everyone was a regent. After the agreement was made, the power brokers went to the last page of the family tree and found Anna, a distant relative with almost no background, who couldn't even read or write and was so poor, she almost begged on the streets to be the new heir to the throne. They found Anna to sign the contract and tried to coax this puppet to take the throne. When Anna signed, the emissary was so happy that he immediately returned to Moscow with Anna. In the process, Elizabeth knew she had no claim to the throne and did not want it. In order to become emperor, her father, Peter the Great, her mother, Ekaterina, Peter II, Nadalia, Menshikov, were all dead. She had already sent too many of her relatives away, and she didn't want to see any more bloodshed. So Elizabeth chose to put her relatives on the throne, but she was outnumbered and outmaneuvered. After all, at the beginning of the power struggle, Elizabeth's defeat was already declared when she was put under house arrest, and the three guards were caught in an ambush. A person with only ideals is not qualified to play politics, but it's not as if she hasn't gained something. Ivan, who had betrayed Peter II, returned the edict to Elizabeth to atone for his sins. He wanted Elizabeth to have a better life, to atone for his sins against Peter. Elizabeth wanted to burn the edict, but Shubin wanted to keep it. Maybe it could be a lifesaver someday. In the end, Shubin took it with him. Soon after, Anna entered Moscow. The ministers thought they were getting a straw puppet, but they didn't know they were getting a big evil that would send them all to the guillotine. With one cheer after another, the Praetorians would take over the throne in a coup d'etat for the umpteenth time under Elizabeth's leadership. This time, however, the Praetorians would not help Elizabeth take the throne, but will puppet Anna. Anna initially gave up her power to be an empress and became a puppet, but there are those who don't want her to be a puppet and want to help her take power to achieve in political goals. Osterman is a man who will stop at nothing to achieve his goals. He kept Peter the Great's reforms that he participated in, and his power, as his own, and would never allow anyone to touch them. But the chaos of two generations of kings has eliminated all of his reforms, and his power has become less and less. Osterman would never allow himself to be without power. Without power, he had nothing, so Osterman thought he'd use whatever he could. He wanted to help Anna take over the throne to gain power. After all, Anna had no one she could trust except her lover Byron. Her rise to power was inevitable. Osterman's first target is Elizabeth. She's the best person to bring in and the one with the most background. Elizabeth may seem like nothing but a good reputation, but she's Peter the Great's daughter. She can mobilize the Praetorian Guard to suppress the Privy Council on the basis of her lineage and reputation. Osterman tells Elizabeth that the Privy Council has all the power now, and the country is in chaos with them. The Romanov dynasty is no more. Is that what Elizabeth wants? He's going to talk about family succession. Even Elizabeth was too smart to reject the plot. She had to make a deal with Osterman, but the two of them couldn't do it alone. Elizabeth finds Anna, and through a few pleasantries, she points out that Anna is a virtual empress, calling her a puppet is a compliment. After all, Anna can't even enter the Privy Council. Her aim was to provoke Anna's anger, so that she would have the ambition to take over the throne. A person without ambition is not qualified for alliance. Anna can't believe she's worse off now than when she almost went begging. Elizabeth offered to make a bet to see if Anna could get into the Privy Council. Anna's jewelry was at stake. Then Anna burst into the Privy Council to prove she was right. This startled the powerful members of the Privy Council. Instead of the warm welcome she expected, the powerful ministers asked Anna why she had barged into the Privy Council and that it was not her place. Anna was a little intimidated and tentatively said she just wanted to see the palace. 
She realized that the Privy Council seemed to be missing a stool, but the Privy Council said there was no shortage of benches and there would never be another one. Then they unceremoniously kicked Anna out. Anna was furious. She ran up to Elizabeth and took off her ring and threw it to her to show that Elizabeth had one. Anna is indeed worse than a puppet. Anna leaves in a rage. Elizabeth looks at the ring and realizes that she has aroused Anna's ambition to take over the throne. But Elizabeth was afraid. She had the feeling that Anna was a wild animal that would go on the rampage. But for the sake of the Russian Romanov dynasty, she had no other choice. The next day, Elizabeth, led by Shubin, finds the Praetorian Guard and leads it in a coup d'etat, just as her father did. Elizabeth tells them that the Privy Council is now a tyrannical power that has overthrown the Empress Anna I. They'll help Anna I regain her power by purging the Privy Council, but the men of the Praetorian Guard are loyal only to Elizabeth, and they shout that they'll help the Elizabeth rise to power. Elizabeth explains that she's supporting Anna I. Shubin also rushes to help Elizabeth guide the public opinion. Afterwards, Elizabeth leads a troop into the palace to meet Anna and says that she's brought her loyal guards with her. She implores Anna to take them to regain the Tsar's honor. Faced with a sharp blade at her door, Anna showed her bloodthirsty face. Her eyes were cold, and she led the guards straight to the Privy Council. At this moment, the Privy Council was still dividing the cake, and when they weren't paying attention, they were surrounded by the Praetorians again and again. Peter the Great, Ekaterina the Great both won their thrones with the Praetorian Guard. These powerful men didn't learn their lesson. They didn't think of eliminating the Praetorian Guard. Under the pressure of the Praetorian Guard, the powerful ministers surrendered to Anna expertly and watched as she tore up her contracts. The ministers were afraid to say a word at Anna's domineering declaration. When it's over, Anna thanks Elizabeth profusely and says she's been a great help to her. She couldn't have been nicer to Elizabeth, but then she embraces Elizabeth with a murderous intent. After all, just because Elizabeth can command the Praetorian Guard, it will means that Elizabeth can put her on the throne as well as take her off. And Anna's idea was Osterman's second goal, to solve all the obstacles to dictatorship. Osterman approached Anna with the idea that they could transfer Shubin and the Praetorian Guard, loyal to Elizabeth, to Elizabeth's side as guards in order to fulfill Elizabeth's love, and then they'd wear out their influence over the Praetorians. When the plan was implemented, Shubin was transferred to Elizabeth's side. He mistakenly believes that Elizabeth intends to destroy his value for the sake of love. Shubin had a fight with an unsuspecting Elizabeth. When Elizabeth learns what happened, she goes to Anna and begs her to rescind the transfer. But Anna is no longer a puppet with no one to turn to. She slouches on the chair and dismisses Elizabeth's plea by coldly stating that the king's orders are not subject to change. Seeing Anna's attitude change, Elizabeth knows she's finally lost her gamble. She has indeed unleashed a beast. At that moment, Elizabeth had no idea that this beast would lead Russia into its darkest decade. She was the most famous and perverted empress in the Russian Empire. In the 10 years of her rule, Russia has been bloodied, and countless innocents have been exiled to Siberia. Thousands of innocent people were sent to the guillotine on false charges. The sound of spies being tortured in the dungeons never stopped for a second. Her 10 years in power have been called the darkest in Russian history. Anna was in power, but she knew that her ministers wouldn't let her go. She couldn't fight them if she couldn't even read. She had to delegate power to Osterman and her lover Byron, and set up the secret office of investigation to help her weed out dissenters. And what Osterman and Byron did with the secret office was brutal. Some of the powerful members of the Privy Council complained that Anna should never have been allowed to take over, or maybe they should have rebelled. The ministers were complaining without noticing that Osterman was writing them down word for word. Osterman was going to tell Anna about it. When Anna found out about the conversation, she ordered the secret office to investigate. Then they surrounded Dolgorukov's house with troops and arrested Dolgorukov and Ivan. They took Dolgorukov and Ivan to the prison and tortured them to find out who their allies were in the rebellion. Dolgorukov couldn't take the torture, so he rattled off names. He wanted to see if Anna was targeting the entire aristocracy. What Dolgorukov didn't realize was that the illiterate Anna didn't care about the rules of the land, but that she would kill anyone who disobeyed her. Osterman and her lover Byron can handle all the affairs of the country. Eventually, under Anna's rule, Duke Menshikov, who had long been offline, was liquidated. Menshikov was executed for poisoning Ekaterina. Dolgorukov and his son were publicly beheaded and exterminated for the murder of Peter II. Duke Yusupov was imprisoned in the secret office for organizing a revolt, and then poisoned to death by Anna. Anyone Anna didn't like was sentenced to extermination or exile on various charges. Elizabeth begged Anna to stop countless times, but Anna either ignored them, or she just gave Elizabeth pardons, and then she had them poisoned. She made Elizabeth go home with a corpse, as was the case with Duke Yusupov. In these dark and turbulent political times, Elizabeth realized there was nothing she could do to save herself. It was then that Elizabeth discovered she was pregnant with Shubin's child. In order to protect her baby, Elizabeth 
who has long been disillusioned with the political situation, proposes to Anna to go into seclusion, and Anna, who long been unhappy with Elizabeth, wanted her gone, so she gave Elizabeth a large house to live in and a royal allowance. Elizabeth took her three guards to the country and lived happily ever after, so happy that she thought the country was no longer in darkness. But what Elizabeth didn't realize was that her maid of honor, Mia, had betrayed her once again. Mia had done many wrongs to Elizabeth because of Guard B's betrayal. Later on, Mia was taken to Sweden by Princess Anna. She hooked up with Dukal and betrayed her master, Anna, and became a part of the cause of Princess Anna's illness and death. After Princess Anna's death, she was driven back to Sweden with no one to turn to. Elizabeth forgave her in the face of the maid she had grown up with. She pretended not to know about Mia's dirty deeds. However, when Mia came back and wanted to be with Guard B, she tried to sabotage the relationship between Guard B and Yusuf Pavne. She failed every time, but Guard B threatened to kill her if she tried again. Wounded out of her wits, Mia went straight to Osterman's alliance against Elizabeth. She wants everyone but Guard B dead, so that Guard B can only be with her. As so, with Osterman at her side, Mia began to tell off the Empress Anna. She accused Yusuf Pavne of compelling Elizabeth to rebel because she was unhappy with Anna's rule due to the death of her father, Duke Yusupov, and that Yusupovne had prepared many poisons for this purpose, and had cursed Anna by sticking little people in her mouth, and Shubin and his guards, who were unhappy with Elizabeth's return, tried to prepare a rebellion. Mia makes the details of the rebellion so real that Anna curses her. Anna wants Elizabeth and the rebels executed. Poor Elizabeth had just accepted Shubin's proposal, with the blessing of the three guards. But the next moment, she's surrounded by secret office troops. The three guards knew, that if they were imprisoned by the secret office, they'd never come back alive. So they drew their swords and started to defend Elizabeth against the secret office. After a fierce battle that was almost impossible to win, everyone but Elizabeth was captured. Elizabeth was taken to the palace and aborted in a coma. A week Elizabeth awoke from her bed. The doctor told her all the bad news. Elizabeth was now like a discarded doll, tears slipping freely down her bleak, bloodless cheeks. Anna didn't give her time to grieve. They found the edict through torture and search, and used it as evidence of Elizabeth's treachery to cut off her royal subsidy. Anna says it's to prevent Elizabeth from using the money to raise private soldiers. Then Anna chokes Elizabeth and says she's going to organize a wedding for her. All she had to do was marry Elizabeth to Shubin, a commoner by birth. Then Elizabeth will be disinherited from the throne. Anna the first would have nothing to worry about. At that moment, Elizabeth has no desire to be angry. She just wants to know what happened to her friends. After Anna left, Elizabeth tried to rescue her friends, but it was all in vain. She watched as the three guards were tortured, but could do nothing. Luckily, the infamous Ashokov is actually a big fan of Peter the Great and Garby's father. After torturing Shubin and Yusupovne, he realized that they probably didn't rebel. So instead of beating them into submission as he had done in the past, he tried to find the truth. Eventually, Ashokov searched for evidence that Osterman and Mia had falsely accused Elizabeth of rebellion, but because of Osterman's position of power, Mia ended up taking the fall. Mia was held by Ashokov awaiting execution. Elizabeth was cleared of the rebellion, but it didn't help Elizabeth's situation. Yusupovne has gone mad from the torture and doesn't even recognize her lover Guard B anymore. Elizabeth, on Anna's orders, puts on a white wedding dress and prepares to marry Shubin, but she was not happy at all. Then Shubin, beaten be in recognition, is brought to the ball, and the rabble around them laughs at them. Elizabeth told Shubin that if they got married and she gave up her right to the throne, Anna would leave them alone, but Shubin refused, because he knew that if Elizabeth wanted to be safe, she would have to become an empress, so he absolutely refused to agree to the marriage. Shubin shouted that Elizabeth was the heir, to this or Anna I was a despicable usurper. This action provoked Anna I deeply. Elizabeth rushed to stop Shubin and told him to apologize. However, Shubin still insists that Elizabeth should be the empress. In the end, Shubin was banished to the North Pole by an angry Anna, and Elizabeth watched Shubin being escorted away by countless guards. At that moment, Elizabeth hated herself for being so stupid as to give up the throne. She looked at Anna I and swore that she would have a revenge one day. After that incident, Elizabeth Saturday by the sea every day and looked in the direction of Shubin's exile. At times, she thought of her lover far away. At other times, she was full of ambition for revenge. At that moment, Elizabeth was approached by the three free guards. Elizabeth was happy to see them healthy, but she felt guilty. If it wasn't for her selfishness, Yusupovne wouldn't have gone mad. The three guards wouldn't have suffered, and Shubin wouldn't have been exiled. If she had honored her father's wishes from the beginning, perhaps none of the tragedies that began with Mother Ekaterina would have happened. Я должна все исправить. Согласно воле Петра Великого, я Елизавета Петровна Романова, единственная законная наследница престола. From that moment on, the naive Elizabeth was dead. What survived was the future Russian Empress Elizabeth I. She will meet her enemies with volcano-like fury. This concludes the first season of the TV series Elizaveta.